I work for an organization called the Software Freedom Conservancy. I'm its executive director and president. And I'm going to be speaking today about supporting free software development through nonprofits. I used to prefer to give a talk about how Conservancy is designed to do the boring work for developers so they can focus on development. But getting turnout for developers when I tell you how I'm going to do all the boring work for you so you don't have to worry about it, the point is you don't want to worry about boring work that's not development. So talking about fundraising tends to draw more people. Uh, so I focused a lot of my talks on that. So uh, Conservancy is a 501c3 nonprofit. That's IRS gobbledygook, which basically means that the work the organization does has to be in the public good has to advance some general benefit for the whole public, which I think open source and free software does all the time because it's released to the public under licenses that permit them to share and copy and modify it. Therefore, it's doing what the IRS wants it to do. Uh, and each nonprofit has a specific mission within that. And our specific mission at uh, Conservancy that we filed with the IRS is to promote, defend, and develop open source and free software. Now, I have a history in free software nonprofits. I've worked uh, only for free software nonprofits since, two, since 1999. And one of my previous employers was the Free Software Foundation. Um, and in a matter of full disclosure, uh, I still talk to Richard Stallman regularly. And I'm on the board of directors of the FSF, which is a separate role from my role in Conservancy that I'm primarily going to be talking about today. But I've certainly been influenced a great deal by the FSF, which that usually sends people running from the room screaming because a lot of people have very strong opinions, either positive or unfortunately more often negative about the FSF. But I think the FSF has a lot to teach us historically about the value of nonprofit organizations uh, for free software. So I am not an historian or anything, but I get a little obsessed with the past a lot. Uh, my wife at least tells me that I romanticize the past to some extent. But uh, I think the past has something to teach us. Uh, and the thing that got me into free software was accidentally hitting the wrong key in Emacs and being presented with the, okay, they're talking about mic is bad, now it's good. Okay, so I'm sitting right outside the light, okay. I don't want to be in the light. OK, so um, I'm going to move around. So where, where's the light? Where am I supposed to be standing? Forward. Forward? I, well, this, there's a whole stage here. I'm supposed to walk around on it, right? I'm a performer. I, you're, you're taking my stage. OK, so, um, so I, I was uh, using Emacs uh, for the first time in 1992. And uh, the, I, I, how many people know backspace versus delete? arguments from long ago. OK, not that many. So I'll explain. So early terminals, uh, there, there was sort of a, a split. There, they all had this key that was up in the upper right-hand corner. And sometimes it was backspace, and sometimes it was delete. And on some terminals, it generated control H to generate a backspace. And in some, it generated the actual ASCII delete character, D-E-L. And there was a huge argument in the Emacs community about whether or not what the default should be for doing effectively backspace in Emacs. And RMS being RMS insisted that backspace not be, actually be delete. And control H was help, which meant that if you were on a terminal that automatically generated control H, when you hit backspace, it brought up help until you remapped the key. Um, and now, if you would start it up and do this, you would start, I mean, what do you do when you hit backspace? You hit backspace a bunch of times, and then you start typing something, right? So you would end up navigating the help menus very quick. And one of the things that would happen is you would get presented with the GNU manifesto if you hit, I guess, backspace H, or backspace M, or backspace GM, or something like that. The GNU manifesto would open in a buffer in Emacs. And this is how I originally read the GNU manifesto. And I have this weird theory, which I haven't told RMS about yet that he actually argued this so that people would read the GNU manifesto by having this problem. Because that's how I found out about this whole free software philosophy. But it, it had a huge impact on me, this document. And I encourage you to go back and read it. It has some weird historical anachronisms, like things like uh, that uh, the entire GNU project was going to be finished by the following November or something like that, things that didn't happen. But he proposes in that essay, this seminal essay of our community, various ways of funding free software. Because there, back then, there weren't Red Hats. There weren't these companies that were 
funding developers to write free software and release it under the GPL or MIT license or Apache license, there was no one writing it. RMS was the first guy writing free software. I mean, you can, the BSD guys were working on things, but their code base was tied up in a lawsuit with AT&T. So the only free software was being raised this, and people were saying, well, how are you going to fund this thing? Nobody can ever make money with free software. It's free, as in freedom, but not necessarily price. And so one of the things he proposed was maybe there should be a software tax. Maybe people should tithe to make free software happen. Or, more interestingly, maybe users should donate money when they like free software programs. And that should fund developers. And in fact, the FSF as an org, is there, is there a problem with the audio or something? What's going on here? OK, I just want to make sure nothing's wrong, because you seem to be talking and worried. Um, so the FSF is actually founded back in the 80s as one of these conduits to cause free software development to happen, to make it possible for free software to be funded through a nonprofit. And it gets one of these statuses that I was talking about under the 501c3 statute in the United States to be a tax-deductible charity that people can donate to. And for 12 years, that is what FSF does as an organization. And people today know the FSF more as an advocacy organization. I'm going to talk in a minute about one of the reasons that transitions happened. But for a good 46%, obviously that number will go down every year, of FSF's history, it was there to do this funding of developers. And I actually went through some old GNU bulletins and found a list of people who were at some point or another funded by the FSF to work on free software. And many of these names are unknown to us today, lost in the annals of history. A couple of interesting names on there are people like Roland McGrath, um, who's, I, mean, I don't know if you people know who Roland McGrath is, he's an amazing hacker. This guy was 16 years old when he wrote most of glibc. He's now a Linux developer, works on, works on the kernel. But I, I mean, this guy wrote a C library when he was 16. He's an amazing developer. And he was funded for many years by the FSF to do all sorts of interesting uh, operating system development work. Jim, Bla Jim Blandy now works for the Mozilla Foundation doing stuff for JavaScript engines at Mozilla. So a lot of these people, like Ian Murdoch, were funded by the FSF to do development. Debian exists because the FSF funded it. Now, the FSF doesn't do this anymore. And part of the reason is, is that from FSF's perspective, most free software is written by volunteers. And from the point of view of many free software projects, there are a lot of volunteers. Now, it's not that the volunteers do this on the nights and weekends. In the early days of free software, a lot of free software was written on nights and weekends by otherwise employed proprietary software developers. Now these developers are paid to do it at their day job, and they work for the usual suspects, who have over the years hired up anybody who was any good in a lot of these major code bases to work for them and contribute to the software. Now, this is a good and a bad thing. There's a big difference between a for-profit company that does things to make money in a nonprofit organization. Ultimately, every for-profit company is trying to make money for whoever its shareholders are, or whoever owns their stake in the company. And that's very different from this idea of having an organization that's focused on the public good. And I believe, ultimately, that it's better if when you focus on free software development, you do it in the public good. And that's why I um, I, I just want to make sure, this, I see this conversation over here, and I'm worried that there's something going on. And so, okay, so, what's that? Okay. Okay, the problem is I can't see this screen in the light. The setup is bad, so I don't know what to do. Um, sorry. So, I mean, I guess I, you can move this screen, right? I mean, I don't know. Maybe. What's that? Closer to what? Which mic? No, I, I, I don't, I, so, okay, so, <laughs> all right, so either stop talking over there or tell me to do something. Pick one. Um, so, uh, so, my belief is that nonprofits are the best place to take care of software freedom. I, I just think that's the right answer. Um, and if you want to fund development, one of the things you can do is donate to a nonprofit, and it creates this firewall from company influence from for-profit influence. And I want to be clear, I'm not against 
the idea of this for-profit volunteer thing. Um, I think that most of our code in the open source and free software world is written by these people, employed by companies who are volunteer. And this idea that I, I'm not sure if Google invented it, but certainly Google made it the most popular, of giving developers 20% of their time, or some other companies do it 10%, to work on any free software or open source project they want to and contribute to it and release it and get it out there, that's basically revolutionized free software development because there are so many people now who have time in their day jobs to give back to free software. And we can't live without that now, frankly, in this community. We need that to continue. But there's a reason these companies do that. They want these code bases to drift in directions that are good for the company. That's why they're paying people. Remember, they're doing it to make money. And their financial interest is what's most important. And the only reason they would do this kind of thing is if it's in their financial interest to give back. Well, you have to consider, well, what's in their financial interest? Well, if code bases benefit, they have features they need, they have improvements they need, that's why they're doing it. They want that code to be out there. So I think as a counterbalance, some software developers ought to be funded by nonprofits, ultimately. Some of them should be. Not, maybe not all, probably not most, in fact, but some. So I think this is the best way we can mitigate this problem of control by for-profit companies to free software projects. It's, it's, I think it's the best option we have right now. And nonprofit organizations are set up to be able to do this. They can collect donations for projects, and those donations can come from individuals who then, when they give to a C3, get a tax deduction in the United States, so they can write off on their Schedule A, on their Form 1040. Um, be, being running a nonprofit, I've become a geek such that I know various numbers of various different IRS forms. Um, and that's a huge benefit to them for their taxes, and it's a huge benefit to the project because they can receive a donation. Um, Corp companies can give as well. It's, it's not prohibited for companies to give to nonprofits. There's details that have to be worked out. Um, and that money can be distributed to the project in all sorts of different ways. The only requirement basically is that the way the money is spent be in the public good. We can't build pools in the back of developers' houses and that sort of thing, obviously. But if it benefits the project and benefits the public, then nonprofits can spend the money that way. And the added benefit of this is that the money coming through a nonprofit, it makes sure that it's spent in the best possible way for the community as a whole, not necessarily one specific company. Even if a company gives to it, it's actually my job to make sure that company doesn't have influence over how the money is spent. So the other thing we can do is for anything that's not a technical issue, not anything that's not development related, the nonprofit can help a developer group figure out how to govern their project in a way that's good for the project and good for themselves um, because most developers are better at writing software and improving software than they are at governance questions. Um, I used to be a developer and I actually am, I had some skills I think, probably not as good as most of you, but I wasn't bad. Um, but for some reason I got into this stuff and so I understand both worlds and my goal is to try to bring better governance and take care of governance pro problems for projects. Now, we don't want to have too many of these organizations, right? There has to be some limit because if there's hundreds of nonprofit organizations out, out there, it's very difficult for donors to figure out. I've, I've already seen we have a couple dozen free software nonprofits and it's somewhat hard for people to navigate that as far as figuring out which nonprofit is which organization, how do I get, get to it? And one of the big problems is that every nonprofit needs a lot of governance work. You need to form a board of directors. You need to file forms with the IRS every year. And the more money you have, the more forms you generally have to file. And you have to have board meetings, and you have to have records of your board meetings. And there's a lot of work that goes into running a nonprofit organization. And it's not the type of work that any given developer is actually going to want to do. I don't like doing it myself. And there are a lot of nonprofits out there where developers end up doing work that they actually really despise because they have to maintain the nonprofit details themselves. And ultimately what happens is l there's less software written in the world, less good free software for the public good written because all these geeks are doing work they hate. So what Software Freedom Conservancy does is it's what the nonprofit folks call a fiscal sponsor. 
And when I say that to folks who aren't nonprofit geeks, they say, oh, you give us money. Well, not quite. What we do is we manage the money for you. That's what fiscal sponsor me means. So one organization exists, has one of all of those things, board of directors, nonprofit filings, all that sort of stuff. And many different projects aggregate under that umbrella together. Each, the way Conservancy does, different fiscal sponsors do this differently. What Conservancy does is each nonprofit, each project has its own fund within Conservancy. So if you want to donate to PiPi, Pi, you can give Conservancy a donation earmarked for PiPi. Pi. And that donation is spent to improve and advance PiPi, Pi, uh, as, uh, as opposed to other projects in Conservancy. Um, the important thing, though, is that there's one governance of the whole organization. And the technical details are delegated back to the project. So I don't tell PiPi Pi how to do whatever project they're doing. Uh, that's not Conservancy's role. Conservancy delegates that all back to them. What I worry about is the questions of governance and how the money's spent and helping them do that. So some of the th things we do with conservancy funding, uh, the most common actually is, is just funding developers to travel to conferences. As you might guess, most projects don't have tons of money. They have somewhere around four or five thousand dollars at any time in their little earmarked fund. Um, and that's the most typical thing they do with that is send developers to conferences like this one to speak uh, and attend and that sort of thing. So that's a very common thing that people end up doing. Uh, the Summer of Code, which is probably the biggest philanthropic program for free software projects in existence today. Uh, they give millions of dollars a year uh, to free software projects uh, just through the summer code alone. Uh, and that money has to be handled by somebody. And Google requires that it be given to some sort of organization. You can't just, somebody can't just pocket it. So Conservancy handles the summer of code payments for all of these projects. The other thing is with dealing with conferences. Uh, Python Software Foundation, which runs this conference, could tell you that it is a lot of work running a conference. They do an excellent job. This is an excellent event. Uh, but it's a lot of work to do that. And, uh, OK. So did I do that? The, OK. So, uh, so the, audio, the audio discussion continues. That, that's the other talk going on in the room. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> so uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the Python Software Foundation does a great job doing that, and, we, and Conservancy, for our projects, handle conferences. I've got three conferences being planned right now, simultaneously, by three different member projects, and we handle all the financial and risk details with it. Uh, the Python, uh, uh, PyCon organizers can tell you that uh, you take a, a substantial amount of risk when you sign a venue contract. You're promising to fill hotel rooms, and if you don't fill them, you have to pay for them yourself. So that's the kind of thing Conservancy takes care of for our projects. The, probably the most interesting thing to all of you that we do is we're actually paying a lot of developers. I'm going to talk a little more in a minute about some of the developers we're paying. Uh, we actually collect donations and we fund developers to do development work. They are contractors to Conservancy. I sign a contract with the developer between Conservancy and them, and they work on the software project under some proposal that was written up by the project. Now, it's our job to oversee all that and make sure it's being done in a way that fits the charitable status, that the donor's money is not being swindled, it's being spent on what we promised to spend it on, the, the software project that we proposed. And that's what Conservancy handles, so the developers can go off coding, some of them being paid to do it. So I want to talk about a couple of Python-specific successes that Conservancy's had. And the earliest one we ever had, actually, Conservancy-wide, not just in the Python, uh, space. Um, I, I did realize eventually that if I move this arm, it ruins everything. So I haven't, I've been trying not to move this arm. Um, I think that's... Oh, I see. Interesting. Um, so, um, so, so in 2008, uh, Conservancy started funding uh, uh, Jean-Paul Caldron. Uh, is there any Twisted team members in the room, by the way? Anybody from Twisted? So, okay. I, I try... Oh, there? No, okay. I tried to get them to come. I tried to get all the projects to come, but they, you know, they, they like me to handle this stuff. I see a few in the room. Uh, we'll get to you in a minute. Um, but uh, John Paul was funded. Uh, basically, he, he needed, uh, they needed somebody to really be focusing on bug triage and fixing things that were coming up uh, and all that sort of thing. And they went around to some of the companies that were relying on Twisted and said, look, we need John Paul to be doing this work. Donate to the Conservancy so Conservancy can fund him to do this work. And we did. And uh, he worked part-time for a good period of time on that. Um, unfortunately, nonprofit work pays less than for-profit work, and, and John Paul has been wooed away to work on, on for-profit projects that, that frankly pay him better. 
Uh, but we're talking about having him come back and do some more work and, and maybe giving him a little bit better rate so that we can do it uh, because he was doing a great job for the Twisted Project. This is one of my favorite successes we had. Uh, so, so Matt McCall walked up to me at the Linux Collaboration Summit in, in April 2010 and, 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 and said this quote. Uh, and he said it in a very Matt way. He was like, there's a serious context switch that has to happen when I switch from kernel space to Python user space. It's taking a lot of time, and I can't work on Mercurial as much. Very matter of fact, sort of, sort of deadpan. And so uh, he said, is there any way that we can solve this through conservancy, what can we do? I said, well, do you, have, do you think there are donors out there who want you working on Mercurial? I said, sure. There's, there's lots of p companies and individuals that rely on Mercurial that would donate uh, to fund my work. And I said, okay, let's write up a proposal and let's fund you. And Matt has been funded ever since then, full time, by conservancy to maintain Mercurial. And his master is effectively me. I mean, I don't do a lot of management. He's a contractor from my point of view. I have him write a report every month and blog about it, about what he does. But he's done thousands of chain sets of his own, merged thousands more from con other volunteer contributors. Basically, Mercurial exists because we're able to fund, through Conservancy, uh, Matt's work to keep Mercurial going. And it's still, I just sent, uh, sent him his uh, check right before I came to this conference. It's still going on today. Um, our most recent success has been, I see PyPy folks in the, uh, in the audience. Um, so, so, so the PyPy folks came to me and said, we have a bunch of things we want to do and projects we want to get done, and we think there's money out there uh, to do them. Uh, and, uh, and I said, okay, well, they, and they were big. They, they want to raise a lot of money. And I said, are you sure? Are you sure there's donors out there? Um, they have amazed me. So uh, they wanted to launch two at once, which I told them don't do. I was like, don't split your donor base. No, 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 the donor base is different. There's so many people out there. There's people who want Python 3 support in PyPy. There's people who want NumPy support. They're different donors. We're going to get both of them funded. I said, if you say so, and I had them add to the contract or add to the proposal things about what do we do if we don't get enough money together to even start the first stage and all this, uh, lo and behold, they've already collected uh, 42000 for each. So together, $84,000 have been collected. This is as of numbers of last Wednesday. Um, and I think that covers, uh, that covers like, what, Holger, what is it? Like, that's like 50 or 60% of, 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 the, of the two proposals. And, they have, I mean, obviously stage one has started. We've got developers on contract working on both projects. And, um, and going forward, I think, I, I think it's likely going to get there. They're likely going to fund the later stages. And I hope you'll go to pipi.org and donate for these projects. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the PyPy developers are so excited about this, they came with me with another proposal. They went around like, no, there's no way. You can't do three at once. Don't do this. Um, and sure enough, we just this week uh, launched uh, the fundraising proposal for the Stackless Transactional Memory Project. Um, and I saw as on the plane, I, we got like, oh, is it? I thought it was, okay, sorry. Um, so I feel dumb now. So I have an error on my slide, Holger's telling so software transactional memory. Um, but it has, it's, it's, okay, sorry. I apologize for the error on my slide. Um, I used to be a developer, I really, do. in fact, the funny thing is, is that my master's degree is in virtual machines and stuff, so I should really understand PyPy of anything. Um, and I make mistakes like this, and I feel like an idiot. Um, this is what happens when you're tw what's that? Okay. Um, yeah, but that's as a you know, that, that's wrong. Not completely correct. It's still wrong. You know, Holger's talking about so it's just slightly wrong. I'm like that's still wrong. I feel dumb. Okay. So, um, but uh, the the other thing I feel dumb about is uh, already I think there's uh, it's not been imported into the system yet. So if you look at the little bar, you'll see zero for for STM. But in fact, I saw on the plane there was a couple of hundred dollar donations from individuals already flowing in just a few days after it went up. And so there's people giving who want to support these projects. Um, and this PyPy developers just amazed me that they can raise money like this. And I'm glad Conservancy can be there to be a conduit for it because it's, uh, it's extremely impressive. Uh, so that's pretty much all I had to say. I wanted to take questions if people want. I know this is sort of a different kind of talk uh, for this conference. I know it's primarily a technical conference and I really thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to come and speak uh, to talk about this kind of issue because I think things like nonprofits can provide a way to fund the work that you want to get done. Uh, and while I think companies should be out there helping and they should be employing people to work on stuff, we, we need a healthy nonprofit infrastructure that's funding, uh, funding software development. So with that, I want to just open it up for questions. I, we have uh, like 15, 10, 15 minutes left for, for Q&A if you want it. So. Uh, yeah, why don't you all come to the mic so they, I mean, hopefully that mic will not have whatever problem my mic has. So, 
Uh, yeah, Holger wants the first question. Let Holger get to the mic here, Holger, and you ask the first question. He, he already found bugs on my slide, so he has a... Uh, hi. Uh, okay. Coming from the academia indu <laughs> industry area, <laughs> that's what it is nowadays. Anyways, um, have you ever... Uh, do you have any advice for getting some of our projects, uh, for helping our projects take an open source license, being able to tell the administration, this is okay, open source is not scary, we're, you know, we're okay to license it? So, there's two, so I think you're, you're right to call it the academic industry because I think that's part of the problem. So, so the, the pushback in academia on open source and free software usually has to do over patents because mm -hmm. It, academia has discovered, uh, I have another talk I give that talks about this, that they can patent stuff. And uh, because there are a lot of people who are very pro-patents and they make a lot of money from patents, they're afraid of many open source licenses, which either at, at a grant like the MIT license does an implicit patent license, um, although MIT disagrees with that, but they're wrong, uh, and the GPL, which grants explicit patent licenses. So. That's probably the push you're going to have. I think the best thing to do is to, I think arguing pure motives uh, is the right thing to do with academic people. Acad academic institutions are themselves 501c3s. They're supposed to be doing things in the public good. Tell them, well, the public good is served by sharing software, and that's what we ought to be doing because we're a 501c3 charity that should be doing that. Uh, most universities are. Um, so that, that would be my suggestion. So Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, Holger, go ahead, please. Um, Bradley, first of all, thank you also for the very professional support from the Conservancy for the Pepper Project. Oh, I, I well, appreciate I'm happy to do that it. a lot. I, I, you guys have so, impressed me. I mean, I, just your no, no, I mean, has been amazing. No, but really, it was very, a very good experience, actually. But I have two questions that might be also of general interest. One is, what happens if you get hit by a bus, you personally? Um, and second, so, yeah. and second question. Um, is there any kind of advance in terms of collecting funds in Europe? Okay, so on the first question, um, so, so I, I have been encouraged, I had a discussion out there with, with some PSF folks and, and other folks. I'm encouraging other nonprofits to do this kind of work, to do fiscal sponsorship like this. Uh, and I hope more of it happens because you're, you're right that it shouldn't be a single point of failure. Um, conservancy, uh, so, so one of the challenges of conservancy, uh, and I'm gonna make a, make a pitch back to, to, to our member projects in the audience, um, it's very difficult to fund conservancy. Um, I rely right now on a very, very large grant from a very large company you all know, um, who is also a sponsor of this conference. If not for that donation, uh, I would have to go half time and I have to fire the general counsel that I hired a few months ago. Uh, so, um, so it's very difficult to fund the general fund at Conservancy because people want to donate to our projects. Now, I haven't wanted to interfere with that because I want people to donate to our projects. The problem is funding the general fund is tough. Um, we need to grow an internal staff at Conservancy so that it's not a sing I'm not a single point of failure, uh, which I agree, I am right now. Um, and we also, on the other side, need more conservancies. We need more organizations willing to do this kind of work uh, as charities. Now, there's a couple of reasons that's tough. One is it's very difficult to get new charities granted, which is another topic altogether because the IRS is confused about what software is at the moment. So there's a lot of C3 applications in the United States sitting in a queue waiting to get C3 status because the IRS is trying to figure out its confusion. So we have a moratorium on new software nonprofits in the US, uh, and hopefully that will get solved. And the other reason is, is that this work is hard. And when I say things like, it's really hard to fund, uh, obviously that, that's not a big pitch to the PSF to say, you should start doing this. And by the way, it's really hard to fund. I just want to tell you that up front. I, mean, I don't want to be honest with them, but it makes it tough for them to think about doing this. Um, I totally get that. I mean, I would feel if I were running a larger nonprofit, it's tough to say, well, I want to get into this fiscal sponsorship thing when conservancy, when that's basically all they do, is saying it's tough to fund. Um, answer your second question in Europe, uh, that is a tough problem. I worked on the European question for a while. We actually incorporated a conservancy. One of our board of directors lives in France. He incorporated Conservancy France. Um, and then we discovered that it's basically impossible to pass money back and forth between nonprofits in, in Europe and the US. And it's true pretty much in every country. There are very strict rules about charitable giving in each country, in part because it's a tax grant, right? I, I truly believe the IRS is granting me something because Conservancy pays no taxes and donations to Conservancy are tax deductible, which means the IRS is missing out, as it were, on a lot of revenue. And as such, quite correctly, they hold us to an incredibly high burden. One of those burdens includes we can't spend too much money outside the US and pass money out to non-US organizations very easily. Um, that you can do it, it's just there's more, a lot of rules involved. The same thing's true in France and other European countries. They're 
enclosed. And I, I thought that we had this idea, actually a lawyer in Europe helped us with it, that we could incorporate in France and then take donations all over the EU. Well, it turns out that's not true either. Um, so I, how we solve this international question is very difficult. I actually encourage people to find a nonprofit where the center is. And I think, Holger, you and I talked about that. I said, hey, do you know of an European, since most of the PyBot developers in Europe, maybe you guys should find a European organization. And there wasn't one. And you guys ultimately joined Conservancy because of it. Um, and so I would love to see a Conservancy-like organization start in every country in the world. The problem is, we're back to your first question, is what happens if I get hit by a bus? If I'm a single point of failure for a lot of this stuff, um, how are we gonna get more people? Because one of the reasons I'm able to do my job reasonably well, I, I think I do, is because I used to be a developer and now I'm willing to do this work. But this work is boring. Man, there are days I wish I was hacking on PyPy. Let me tell you, especially doing all this fundraiser PyPy, I'm like, man, that's cool work. I wish I were doing that. Um, so you have to find people who are willing to give up what they love to try and help everybody else do what they love. And, and I'm a masochist and most people aren't, so I'm willing to do it. I'm gonna get some more Q&A here, so go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, there's, in other countries, there may be ends around the uh, patents and so on, the intellectual property that universities claim they own. At least where I am in Japan, the individual has certain rights that are not overridden by the fact mm -hmm. that he's an employee of the, the uh Okay, well, university. yeah, I don't want to get too off on that tangent of patent issues. Sure. This is really not a talk about patents. I can give you a talk about software patents, but I wasn't invited to give one, so I'm going to pass on commenting on that. Um, hey, so um, I work for Yelp on an open source project called Mr. Job. It's a MapReducer library. And I was just wondering, you, could you give some concrete examples of sort of the insidious effects of having a for-profit company run an open source project? And also, how much does it depend on who's paying for it? How much does it just depend on the people? Because I know that, like, I'm sort of hungry for use cases outside of Yelp, but I see Yelp's use cases and I understand them really well. And that, I mean, that naturally biases or guides my thinking. So, uh, even I, so there's this phenomenon that's happened, which is actually a really good phenomenon. And, and people, Josh Burkus, is Josh in the room? Um, Josh called this, I think he might have coined this, throw it over the wall. And it, it, this idea of throwing code over the wall is great in some sense, because it means open source code and free software code is getting released. The downside is, is, is basically what you're saying, which is, which is it's not that Yelp necessarily is being nefarious on purpose uh, in any sort of way. The problem is the people who started the project are all inside the company. They're still there. And they're all working on it. And they're releasing the code. They're pushing up changes out to the world. But there's a governance question of, well, because everybody who's interested in it is inside Yelp, and it's really hard to recruit people to come and get involved with it. Uh, and, and become part of it. I actually think nonprofits can help with that. And I actually encourage companies. Um, Rackspace came to me when they were releasing OpenStack, and I said, the th first thing you need is a nonprofit, right? And, and I wish they'd done it faster because there's a lot of criticism now in the OpenStack community that why is the nonprofit not done yet? I mean, it's getting there. But I told them when I met them at OSCON the, the, the year they announced, which was like two years ago, I said, start the nonprofit right away. That was my main piece of advice because you need a place where people can gather that's neutral territory to really get the project going. And it's tough to build that neutral territory um, without a nonprofit. I don't know how else to do it without a nonprofit uh, if it's coming out of a company. So that's a couple. I, I don't think I fully answered your question. But you can talk to me later. We'll talk more. Well, I want to get, uh, let's talk offline. And let me get a couple more people online here, because I got five uh, minutes left. Sorry, we have next talk starting at 520. So you can catch up the speaker okay. offline. OK, so I've just been cut off anyway. So Thank you. There's Thanks that. So